we're diving into Mark. We're diving into Mark so that we can not only know what the gospel is, but experience the character of God revealed in Jesus. And to be so equipped to be able to see how he interacts with the world that we then can in turn interact in the world that, in a way that honors him as well. What do I mean by that? As we dive into the book of Mark, we dive into the book of Mark, we're going to see three people groups. Of course, the main character in all of this, not character, but it sounds like I'm talking about some fictional story. The main point of all of this is Jesus Christ himself. But then we're going to see the disciples, and we're going to see crowds of people, and we're going to see the religious leaders over and over and over again. And this study in Mark is appropriate for us because we're all called to be disciples. And so there's things that we can relate to in all of that. Their struggles and their wrestles. Their call to growth, our call to growth. Their being equipped and sent out, our being equipped and sent out. And like so very many people, right, we've all been part of the crowd. We've all been part of the crowd and people have changed. Circumstances change. Our information flow changes. But the personalities of people and how we do things is in. Crowds are crowds. And so there are crowds of people that need to know Jesus. That's why we're equipped to grow. That's why we're sent out. And then, of course, the religious leaders of the day, as we've been looking in the book of Galatians, they just stir up all kinds of conflict. And we had to remember the words of Jesus who said, blessed are the peacemakers. And so we looked at the conflicts to see where not to go. A warning of sorts of where we don't need to be. All right? So if you have your Bibles and you open it up, to uh, Mark chapter 1. Um, little history lesson. Mark is John Mark. Do you know who John Mark is? John Mark is Barnabas's. Barnabas's? Is you know Paul and Barnabas? Paul had just wrote Galatians. Barnabas was his uh, ministry partner, right? Uh, formerly known as Joseph was such an encourager in the church, they changed his name to uh, Barnabas, which means the encourager. John Mark, Mark, also John Mark, uh, he is Barnabas' nephew. Uh, I make mention of this, to the validity of the book, which goes on, I believe, to uh, just even in its existence, uh, you know, um, demonstrate to us what I've already modeled to you in being disciples, the crowds, and the religious work that's taking place. And so as we look at that, just as a bit of a history to go along with it, uh, you realize that in uh, all of this, you still stay in Mark, but all of this is recorded for us in the book of Acts. Uh, John Mark's, John Mark, Mark, the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. I believe is Peter's account, Peter's gospel. Well, why didn't they name it Peter's gospel? Because Mark wrote it, but he gets his information from Peter. And the very first time he ever met Peter was after Peter was miraculously released from jail in Acts chapter 12. When Peter uh, left, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. And what this immediately tells us, right, is that Mark is a nickname. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Eakes. Mark is a nickname. No, you know, and he has, I, I don't know why, I don't know what, but he's known as John. And thank the Lord that they do this, because we have John, the Apostle John. We have John the Baptist. We have John, this guy named John, also known as Mark. You know, so we're cleaning some stuff up. But he's first introduced to Peter when Peter is released from jail. Then when Barnabas and Saul are sent out, they brought, I'm in uh, still in chapter 12, but you can look it up later, 25. They brought with them to complete their service, John, whose other's name was Mark. So it's the same guy. But it was then as Paul, Paul and Barnabas were set apart that Barnabas wanted, uh, excuse me, that, that in all of those things they came to a new town, John Mark left. Paul and Barnabas, and that becomes a schism for later. Where did, where did John Mark go to? He went back to be with Peter, and that's where we have the beginnings of this gospel recorded in AD 50 or AD 60, somewhere in there. 
Okay, so that's all of this stuff brought to light. We'll talk a little bit more on the validity of some of those things as we go through. But uh, just, just as a point of information, uh, that's, that's how we get all of this information. It's also a special noteworthy that we are not, we're not following the notes. Forget the notes. Dear God, I haven't helped John Boy. Would you do me a favor? Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We will see that over and over. The beginning. You might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, this isn't the beginning, right? This has always been, and that is true. Before the foundations of the world, God knew in the determination to carry out what would need to be required. We see it over and over again in the, in the First Testament. We say the prophetic work, everything pointing that God would send the Christ, that Jesus would come. Recorded for us in Mark chapter 1, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son. As it was written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, that being John the Baptist, John the free church guy. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism and proclaiming a and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching, saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The three groups. Here we're introduced to one. The crowds thronging, longing, searching after something, chasing after John down by the river. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about camel's hair and leather belts and wild honey and locusts, right? But if you're a serious Christian, you should start doing that. <laughs> That's not what that means. That's not what that means. But I take it, it was a striking difference than the rest of the world, right? And it's not real attractive wearing camel's hair and a leather belt, but there was something that was taking place beyond John. All of Judea was going out to see him. That's the attraction of the gospel. The pre-work even that's being done. And I might make special note of the message that John is teaching. It says that he was calling to repentance people of their sin. The life transformation that we talked about that is in the gospel doesn't happen if we make less of sin. And I think that's what's going on in our society today. We live in a culture that wants to dilute the power of sin, the description of sin. Consequently, like if I ignore it, it's not really sin. But the fact of the matter is, we've said it before, in order to find life transformation, in order to find the power of gospel alive in us, we must first come to the end of ourselves and call sin, sin. Because he's faithful to forgive. Faithful to forgive. And you see, and I know I've said this before, and it, it, it bothers me not to repeat it. If we do not call sin, sin, then what did Jesus die for? You see, if we make little of the sin in our lives and in the world, then we make a mockery of the cross of Christ. And if you mock the cross of Christ, if you make small that sacrifice, you dishonor him. And, and if in a way you're trying to be self-determined to decide what is and isn't sin, somehow, some way, your self-determinism is deciding what is and isn't worthy of Jesus. And if you make Jesus to be out something other than who he is, 
well, then you don't find the life transformation that our hearts are longing for. It is so attractive. It is so powerful. It is so magnificent that the, all of Judea, you mean all of Judea, all of Judea, I mean, it's a lot of people thronging after this. It's just like in our world today. People want to know the pure, unadulterated, beautiful gospel that is willing to call sin, sin, because the solution is so grand. But what it requires is what's shared with us in the text. Proclaiming repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and they were confessing their sin. <laughs> confessing simply meaning to agree with God. Right? Yeah. But also in proclamation. In proclamation. I mean, Here's part of the problem. Part of the problem in the day and age we live in, and now look, I'm confessing on social media, I participate in Snapchat and Instagram to keep up with my kids. Right? So I get to see pictures of my granddaughter for crying out loud. But one of the things that ticks me off so stinking much is that it disappears. You, you look at it, it's like, hey, hey, oh, it's gone. Right? And I think we, people like that because that's the same kind of thing we do with sin. We just, we're not going to talk about it. If we don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. If we don't, if we don't mention it, if we don't look at it, it just, just, you know, oh, if we just be able to say it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> no response. But, and there is certainly, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, He forgives us of our sin and casts it as far as the east is from the west. Remembering it no more. But we do. We do. It doesn't go away, so let's stop acting like it. We st I, I still remember some of the very, very stupid things I did in 1987. Thank God he forgave me, right? But then what happens is, is that when I turn to Jesus and I see his heart and I see his character, and because sin is sin and because I've confessed it is sin, then I am drawn all the more to my Savior. And my life changes, right? In appreciation for who he is. The apostle, excuse me, John the Baptist was a, a, a straight path maker. He was preparing the way for Jesus in doing so. Each and every one of us, just like we're going to call to repent and confess our sin in light of the gospel, not so that we make much of the sin, but so that we make much of the solution. And growing in our appreciation of the character of Jesus, of who he is and what he's done for us, each and every one of us has to, in some small way of reflection, think back to the people that God has used in our lives to prepare the, our hearts and minds for when we did or will receive the gospel. You stop to think about the people that, that did all of the work to bring us right here now to this time and place. Everything that went. The people that prayed for you. The people that invited you. The people that shared the gospel with you. The people that invested you. Thank God for that. Like Jesus will honor John later in his ministry in the account that we study. But we also want to remember those things as well. Look with me in verse 9. Look with me in verse 9. Um, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son. With you, with you I am well pleased. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. There's nothing there. First and foremost, did you catch this? The word immediately. I love this word in this book. Immediately, that means at once, with no intervening time, suddenly, suddenly, something happens. That word immediately is going to be used over and over and over again in this book. Matter of fact, you could don't fact check me on this one. In the ESV, the word immediately is used ten times in two chapters alone. What's that say to your heart? That tells us all that there's a great sense of urgency. Boom, 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 boom. Immediately, immediately, immediately. But we live in a day and age where we're going, eh, I don't know, we're going to get around to it. Let's see what happens. Kind of busy. We'll, we'll, we'll find out. No, the gospel is a, there's a great urgency. There's a, there's a great call. The people are in trouble now. People need to hear it now. We need to be equipped now. We need to grow now. Life transformation needs to happen now. Immediately. 
We make excuses, like raising our children. And we, and we thank God, right? That God doesn't, God doesn't demand first-time obedience, but he does call us to understand the great, uh, the great urgency to move forward in these things, somehow, someway pressing it all out. And I, I'm not saying that I've got it all under wraps or quite understand exactly how this is all going to work, but there is an urgency to what's taking place. And it's been credentialed by heaven itself. When he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending him on him like a dove, hearing a voice, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. I read one commentary. I read one commentary that said that all of that was private. That because it says that, you know, coming up out of the water, coming up out of the water, Jesus saw the heavens tear open, and he, that being Jesus, heard the voice. Well, then who recorded this, right? Oh, the Spirit lived in my... I, okay, fine, whatever. If you want to believe that that was all private, fine. I don't believe it. This is public as all get out. Because Jesus came to give an example, and we're going to see that again. This is the example of Jesus. That he is a participant in the same things we're called to participate in. We're called to participate in the New Testament. We're called to participate in the kingdom work that is being worked out here through, through John that Jesus is going to pick up. But Jesus has given us an example. And God is so pleased with this that as soon as he's laid in the water, which, which is a foreshadow of the things to come in future chapters. As soon as he's laid on, woo, immediately in heaven has to take notice and say, this is it. Yeah. And a voice from heaven. This is my son. And someone's rather like, did you hear something? No, there is no doubt what was to be heard. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. This is Jesus. As I said before, the beloved of God, Peter, Mark, the gospel, in this book we see, just as we did in, in uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in verse 11, a voice came out of heaven, you are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, lest there be no doubt. Carry on with me in verse 12. In verse 12, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and he uh, and was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. We're going to have some overlap and some things as we go through the book of Mark, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time in here, but as to say this one thing here today. As I said before, Jesus leaves us an example that he's a participant in leading us in the things that he calls us to, and namely uh, this, this new ministry, this new work. And here, Jesus also is our example, was being compelled, led to the wilderness to be tempted. Yes, to be tempted. And then first and foremost, what we have to realize is, is that as the Bible has declared that Jesus was tempted in every way, yet he never sinned, we need to first realize that temptation is not sin. Temptation is not sin. But we also realize that we do sin. Why do we sin? Because we stay at temptation too long. Right? If you stay at temptation too long, there's only so much you can take before you fall. How do we equip our feet to flee temptation? To spend more time with Jesus. To be so adequately equipped, realizing in God's providential and beautiful protective power, Jesus, I'm not telling you to go hang out with wild beasts right now, okay? Right? It says he was... He was Tempted in the wilderness by Satan, and he was with wild animals. All I'm saying is, come the first weekend in November, you can put this into practice in deer hunts. <laughs> but just like Jesus, the angels were ministering to him, right? God's protective power, protecting him amongst the wild animals, and God's great care revealed in him sending ministers of grace to his son and who he was pleased those same ministering agents taking care of us as well. Verse 14, 
Now, after John was arrested, I got to tell you guys, up in uh, Montevideo, up in Montevideo, uh, one of the people that participated in the service was Officer Glenn Dirksen, state trooper. And, and he had a call before I could actually have him come up and arrest me. After John got arrested. But, but, uh, but we all have a season of ministry. And we're going to talk more later about John the Baptist. But John did absolutely everything that was asked of him. And he joined Jesus in the sense of urgency and importance that was there and needed. And then he kind of, a handing of the baton, if you will. You know, he's done everything he did. Jesus credentialing John's ministry, participating in all of those things. And then John was arrested and Jesus picked up. John was arrested. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now is the time. The time is fulfilled. Uh, I am not a mathematical wizard. Genius of any time. I love math. I used to really enjoy math. And I still remember that the word is means equals. Right? Is is equals. The time is fulfilled. The time equals fulfillment. It has happened. Boom. Everything that had been prophesied was bringing us into this place and point in time in this one moment. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. It is the Son of God that begins this, this uh, gospel. It is the beloved Son of God whom He credentials. And it is the Son of God who makes the announcement of the kingdom of God, which is at hand. And these words written in red say, repent and believe in the gospel. Now, I can trust you. Some of you have heard me tell this story before, but others of you haven't. So you're going to hear it again anyway, or you're going to hear it for the first time. I love this chunk of scripture, which is a common theme you're going to hear me say an awful lot in the book of Mark. Okay? Do I apologize now? No, I'm not going to apologize. I have lots of favorite parts. I love this part. This is my first favorite part. Okay? But as we go through it, what I know myself, and maybe what you know, is that when I was growing up, the gospel was reported to me to be that Jesus died for sin, that he was raised from the dead, that I can be forgiven, and I can go to heaven. Amen? That was the gospel. I knew the gospel. I wasn't ashamed of that. I was glad for it. Happy to have it. Jesus died for sin, was raised from the dead. I'm forgiven. I go to heaven. But if that's the limited translation of the gospel, then how can he say the kingdom of God is at hand? Repent and believe the gospel. Well, is that to say to believe in the future things? Yeah, maybe. But nobody's had that revealed to them yet. But when he says the kingdom is at hand, that's to say that King Jesus is on earth and with a steel determination, the same sense of urgency that brings about all of these things. It is fulfilled. It will be finished. Nothing will deter me. And we will watch him go with that same determination to Calvary. And so whether he says in the beginning, he says in the conclusion, it is fact. Repent and believe in the gospel, which is what? It is the kingdom rule and reign of King Jesus. Amen. Not what we want it to say. Not what we want it to be. Not what we want to call sin. Not how we want to engage our neighbors. Not how we want to advance the gospel. We owe one allegiance and one allegiance only. And that is to Him. The King to do as He has called us to do. The very reasons He's called and equipped us to be here. And that's what we're going to say. That's what we're going to look for. That's what we're going to look at as we study the book of Mark. Peter's gospel. I said before, I, I find some interesting parts uh, in the uh, credentialing of this book. Whether you know the flaws, you read Read all you want. Oh, the, the, the gospel of Mark, it's a bit mysterious as to who wrote it. No, it's not. It's so evident who wrote it. And I'll tell you why. Okay? You guys familiar with a couple of these Peter stories? Right? Peter walking on the water. Remember that? Remember when Jesus is walking across the water and he's like, Oh, it's good. No, it's the Lord. He gets out of the water. You know that account? Guess what? 
That story, that fact story, that historical fact is not in the Gospel of Mark. You're like, well, there then. Peter must not have wrote it. Or got, you know, right? No, it's true. I mean, you stop to think about it. He's the only other person other than Jesus to walk on water. Humbly, Peter omits it. He doesn't include it. I, I think that's significant. I think that's significant. Right? Peter also records of himself, right? That he's the one. He's the one. This is in here. We're going to look at it in the future. He's the one that when Jesus will be arrested in the garden, he takes out a sword and he cuts some guy's ear off. Slices the ear right off. Peter confesses that about himself, right? He also includes in this story that he denied Jesus Christ three times. Three times. Little side note. So that's like chapter chapter uh, 14, 15. <laughs> chapter 14, 15 in the book. And right there in the middle, there's this little paragraph. Uh, in this paragraph, and it's only in this gospel, it's only in Mark. And it says, and while they were in the garden, there's some creepy little man. No, there's, there's a young man, right, watching and looking at them, and he's wearing nothing but a sheet. And when the Roman soldiers see him, they go to grab him, and he flees, and he runs around and naked. Okay? That's in there, only here. And so I like it to this. Peter's including all of these disparaging things about himself. And then John Mark's like, hey, can I write that one thing about me? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's fair, but it seems to me to fit. <laughs> you know? But again, just like Peter changed, impetuous Peter, Peter who was quick to run and quick to burst in anger, quick to do all of these things, Peter changed. This is recording the account, remembering what Jesus did, the encounter of the gospel. We too can grow and change. And what I mean by that is, it's just like Peter walking in the water, when he began to fail, he began to find himself in deep water, sinking. Ladies and gentlemen, I propose to you that it's easier for me this morning up here preaching to you because I'm not wearing a mask and you are. I know that. We're in deep water. We're in a world that's so confused and so hurt and so frustrated. We can't seem to figure out what to do or how to conduct ourselves and what it should all look like as we try to care for as many people as possible. The world's hurting. There's some huge problems, big stuff. We're sinking. Just like Peter, though, sometimes what happens is we're taking our eyes off of Jesus and we're looking at all those storms of life around us. Ladies and gentlemen, he's bigger than that. He's compassionate. He's caring. You look at the story, we'll look at it. He's right there. Jesus is there. You think that he went through all that he did with the great sense of urgency, this compelling force of love that drove him to the cross, that we might be saved, that we might be participants in the kingdom. Do you think he did all of that so he could just leave us? He's right there. Stop looking at the storms of life. Cry out and ask for his help. We live in a world who, like Peter, is doing a lot of wounding at the moment. There's a lot of ear slicing going on. Isn't there? Yeah. You don't believe me? Well, some of you have already, already closed all your social media accounts. You're done. You just can't take it anymore. People are hurling things at each other. It's just so unchristlike. It's not even funny. The world's hurting. If we see it, the world sees it. But if we know Jesus... We know Jesus to be the healer. Peter thought he'd take everything into his own hand, cut this dude's ear off. Jesus, right there, heals the soldier. Jesus is the healer to this situation. Now is the time for you and I to know the gospel, to know the author, the owner of this story and share it with the world who's over in the, 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 the mode of thinking that the only way to get ahead is to wound one another. It's got to stop. And sadly, since we're calling sin, sin, and we're willing to own up to it because Jesus means so much to us, if we're all honest, at times, we've denied Jesus too. Maybe on purpose because we're afraid of what people will think. Maybe, just maybe accidentally, because we didn't see all the way through everything. But sometimes, incidentally, we deny him because we never took the time to know him. 
That's what this journey in Mark is all about. The journey in Mark is to grow so close to Jesus, to know him. So that we don't get distracted by, yes, we look at the disciples and we look at the crowds and we look at the religious leaders, but we look to Jesus. We see him as our example. We see him as the lead. We see him as king who proclaimed the time is now and that he saves us unto himself to equip us so that with the same compassionate heart we can reach down and help those who are sinking. With the same caring heart we can reach out and touch those who need healing. And with the same confidence, each and every one of us, the same confidence that Jesus exhibited that he would fulfill what he came to do, that we would live that out and never deny. That's why he's equipped us. That's why he's called us. That's why he wants to use us. Because the world needs to know what we know. And we need to grow in what we know. Let's bring team up.